Asian extreme Russian religious orthodox nationalists, you know, this idea all bad things come from the West. And here again you can see how relative history, how you can manipulate, because I really hate them. Here you can see the racism of many Western Marxists. You know, they have this big problem to explain. Marxism, which started with such a nice theory, global liberation, how did it got so screwed up that it ended with a total catastrophe of Stalinism? The standard answer, totally false, I think, is uh, Asi uh, Asiatic mode of production, Asiatic despotism. That the mistake was that the first revolution happened in Russia. Russia was too much part of the Asiatic world, and so there, the new socialist uh, regime got, as it were, infused with a dose of Asiatic despotism because of the leading role of Soviet Union in the communist movement. They infiltrated others, blah, blah, blah. Total stupidity, totally, totally wrong. But uh, uh, what is interesting, I experienced this when I visited Russia, is that if you ask Russian nationalists, they will tell you exactly the opposite story, which I think has more, it's closer to truth. That no, that if there is a historical model for Stalinism, it's Russian modernizers, it's the West. It's no wonder Stalin liked Peter the Great and those big Tsarist demonstrators, uh, sorry, modernizers. No, if anything, Stalin was the new Peter the Great. You know what Peter the Great is. Abolish Moscow, Petersburg, extremely brutal, violent, global mobilization, imposed modernization. So, but let's go on. So, after, in this period when they start to lose their legitimacy, especially in German Democratic Republic, they started to invent, uh, sorry, to, so they basically tried to appropriate the entire history of their part of Germany, eastern part, Prussia, to cut a long story short, and it's very nice how till late 50s or even mid 60s, Frederick the Great was dismissed, as you know, feudal bourgeois, Prussian militarism. All of a sudden, even Frederick the Great was rehabilitated as progressive bourgeois, modernizer, blah, 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 and so on. No? And, of course, the key element in this modernization, in this uh, reappropriating the past, was Martin Luther. All of a sudden, he was big progressive, son of our people. And I remember seeing in the early 80s, I think, even also on our TV, they did celebrating his, I don't know, 400, I don't know what, anniversary, I don't know even of what, of life, death, probably death. I don't, uh, they did a big, uh, like, uh, I think, six or ten hours mini-series of Luther's life. Of course, as communists, they had somehow to justify the fact which I mentioned, you know, that Luther turned against the most progressive movement at that point, the peasant. Incidentally, <coughs> Luther did the same with the Jews. You know? First, he was totally pro-Jewish, claiming that Jews were right to speak to their religion, because Catholicism was, you know, the core of Babylon and so on, which I think... Today, Rome is the whore of Babylon and body, but that's another story. But, but I want to say that, uh, so, so he thought Jews were right, but his idea was, but now that I returned Christianity to its origins, Jews should join us, no? Should convert. They didn't, so he became even more ferociously anti-Semitic. No? Okay, but let's go on. So, uh, they had the problem to account for this. How to rehabilitate him as a truly progressive, but nonetheless taking into account his, uh, his uh, opposition to, to, to this peasant rebellion. So they have, in one installment of this series, they have an encounter of Thomas Mincher, you know, the main, and incidentally he is very interesting if you deal with theology, he not, was not just a great revolutionary leader. Some German friends are telling me Thomas Mincer is well worth reading as a theological writer. He has a wonderful reading of the Bible as an allegory to be used for ongoing political struggle and so on and so on. So uh, they talk, and it's breathtaking naivety, historicist. Mincer said, fuck you, but you said, 
original Christianity return, but that's what he did, no class, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Luther answers him with some kind of a, almost a kind of a Marxist avant la lettre, where you, he tells Mincer, you are right, but you want already a further popular workers' revolution. But the forces of production are not yet enough developed for that. We first need a bourgeois revolution with personal freedom, property, and only after a couple of hundred of years this will develop, <coughs> it will be part, you know, this is the impossible position, like this is what Hegel strictly prohibits. Hegel's absolute knowledge, it's not this, it's precisely this closure when it's clear that you are totally caught in your time, that you cannot, there is no way, how should I put it, to step on your shoulder and, uh, and say, and how should I put it, to see yourself objectively as what you are. Which is why I think Hegel is much more materialist and in this sense, to, but we will come to this later, totally incompatible with uh, the standard, later, orthodox, Stalinist, historical dialectical materialism, where, what's the standard position of historical materialism? It's not uh, an engaged position, it's based on objective knowledge. I think if you can really understand what Stalin was about, you should read, you get it everywhere on the, um, on the internet, his big haha, philosophical writing, on dialectical and historical materialism, where he explains why Marxist, Marxist theorists joined the workers and contributed to workers' struggle. He said like this, he said that at the end of 19th century, the working class was still a minority in Russia, but Marxist scientists saw that although farmers and others were a majority, uh, workers had a great future. They saw the future development. They saw which way the history is running, so they decided to join the winning side, as it were. This is totally anti-authentic Marxist. This idea that first you objectively establish the historical tendency towards end of capitalism, working class revolution, and then you knowing the tendency of history, posit yourself, you as a particular historical agent, as an instrument of realizing this historical necessity. This is what Hegel totally prohibits. That's what Hegel aims at with his well-known, usually interpreted as a conservative saying that you know at the end of his introduction to philosophy of right that the all of Minerva only takes off uh, in the dust and so on, that uh, this is precisely the non-necessary, the open contingent Hegel. For Hegel, an act is always blind. You do something you cannot include into it, you cannot include into the act, as it were, its own result. Not, and now we come to the crucial point, not because history is too complex and we don't know what, but it's not out there that the situation is too complex, it's here. You cannot, you know, it's the problem of self-reference, as it were. You cannot include yourself into the picture. That's why, again, you can only discover a necessity uh, retroactively. And this, as I will try to show today, this is also, it's absolutely closer how to read Hegel's historical necessity. It's always a retroactive necessity. It's not that history is some process which appears to us participants as contingent, but there is some kind of a, a reasoning history, absolute hidden subject, who, where it is written in advance, what is history and pulls the strings. No, it, necessity emerges in a retroactive way. There are, uh, how should I put it, once things happen, they retroactively become necessary. In many of my books,